Welcome to In the Frame, Musings from the Global Art World with Gene Seidman. Today's edition is an homage to Christo. The artist Christo, best known for massive, awe-inspiring public art projects, died just 11 days shy of his 85th birthday on June 13th. His projects were collaborations with his wife and partner, Jean-Claude, along with teams of co-collaborators. The duo created some of the most audacious and spectacular large-scale environmental public art installations ever. Monumental and epic in scope, think Stonehenge in England and the geoglyphs on the Nazca Plains in Peru. Christo was born in Gabrovo, Bulgaria in 1935. As a kid, he drew all the time, and at the age of five, he decided that he wanted to become an artist. Here's a drawing he inked of his father. He studied at the Fine Arts Academy in Sofia, Bulgaria. After visiting his aunt and uncle in Prague in 1957, he continued on a European tour, traveling to Vienna, then Geneva, and ending up in Paris in 1958. Christo and Jean-Claude met in October 1958 when he was commissioned to paint a portrait of her mother, Prasilda. Take a look. She was born Jean-Claude Denat de Guibillon in Casablanca. She graduated with a degree in Latin and philosophy from the University of Tunis in 1952. She was always known as Jean-Claude, just Jean-Claude. The two lovers were born on the same day, June 13th, in the same year, 1935. Christo was fond of saying they were born at the same moment. They became partners in life and in art. Christo was already wrapping small objects, cars and furniture, but after meeting Jean-Claude, their scale broadened. Within three years, they realized a project on the docks in the harbor of Cologne, Germany, involving wrapping and stacking dozens of oil barrels with cloth and rope. They originally worked under the name of Christo, sidestepping the tremendous prejudices against female artists, then and now. And in 1994, they retroactively credited their large-scale outdoor works to both Christo and Jean-Claude. They considered themselves true artists, refusing all financial sponsorships and corporate money, raising the necessary funds, often millions of dollars, by selling preparatory sketches models, and photographs of the completed installations. The couple would fly in separate planes. In case the plane crashed, the other could finish the projects. Sometimes they would meet in the airport, kiss, and then proceed to board their respective flights. The couple moved to and were married in New York City in 1962. Their son, Cyril, was born two years earlier. They loved to say they were illegal immigrants living in an illegal building in Soho. Eventually, they bought the building. It was on Howard Street. With each project, their fame grew and their impact widened. Here are a few of my favorite projects. In October 1969, with the support of the Australian collector John Caldor, Wrapped Coast was created with the assistance of over 110 collaborators, including professional mountain climbers at Little Bay, just nine miles southeast of the center of Sydney, Australia. The million square feet of fabric covering more than 1.5 miles or 4.2 kilometers of rugged shoreline was, at the time, the largest single artwork ever made. In 1983, the controversial project Surrounded Islands Biscayne Bay near Miami, Florida was realized with the help of 430 volunteers, including 6.5 million square feet of pink woven polypropylene fabric floating around 11 islands. The installation lasted just 14 days. There was public outcry 
and historical vindication. For two weeks in May of 1985, they transformed the famous Paris Bridge with a project entitled Point Neuf Wrapped. The bridge completed in 1606 during the reign of Henry IV connects the left and right banks and the Ile de la Cité in the heart of Paris. The 300 installing volunteers deployed 450,000 square feet of woven fabric. Silky in appearance, sandstone in color. The project attracted 3 million visitors. The wrapping of the Reichstag followed in Berlin in 1995, followed 24 years of governmental lobbying across six presidents. Wrapped in silver fabric and fastened with blue rope, it was a spectacular event marking Berlin's return as a global artistic center. In later years, Jean-Claude dyed her hair bright red. She once joked that the stresses of wrapping the Reichstag turned Christo's hair gray and hers red. The gates of Central Park in my beloved New York City opened to the public in February 2005 for 16 days. It took 26 years from the first proposal to installation, and only with the permission of New York's new mayor at the time, Michael Bloomberg. A total of 7,503 pieces of saffron-colored, 16-feet-tall fabric were placed on 23 miles of paths in and around Central Park. The project, costing $21 million, was completely self-funded. I visited three times, and the experience was transformative. I still have a swatch of fabric that the volunteers handed out for free. And I can remember how the two artists would motor around Central Park in a gifted Maybach Rolls, full of joy and pride, delighting in their realized project in their adopted city. Being an artist isn't a profession, it's an existence. When asked would she ever retire, she shot back, artists don't retire, they die. She did in 2009 at the age of 74. Asked what he missed most about his wife, Christo said, the fighting. This is what I miss most of all because after 50 years of living together, her attitude, not bending, not compromising, that's what I miss most. We had a unique process. Christo and Jean-Claude believed in beauty. They captured the imagination of the world. They were courageous, artistic visionaries. Their work was genius and magnificently ephemeral, living on in the viewer's transformed memory. I, for one, will be in Paris for the opening of the wrapping of Le Arc de Triomphe. I hope you'll join me. And that's another edition of The Frame, Musings from the Global Art World with Gene Seidman.